So, okay, let's start and uh, welcome to the um, I think third um, seminar class on discrete mathematics. So uh, today we have several uh, tasks to perform. And the first one will be uh, to discuss the problems left from the uh, assignment last time, which was uh, on first order logic. Uh, so uh, there are two links in the chat. And for people who will watch it on YouTube, the link to the problem sheet will be posted in the description of the video. Uh, so uh, the Jamboard, will, we will write down there the, mm, what we're going to do, and I will share it on the video, mainly for recording. Okay, so uh, first I would like to ask you which uh, problems would you like to discuss from this? Uh, problem three. Okay, then let's start with problem three. Uh, so uh, let's first write, write down the formulation. This for all x, there exists y such that q of x, y, this is one part of the formula conjunction for all x, y, and z, uh, we have uh, not q of x, x, and if q of x, y, and q of y, z, then uh, q of x, z. One, two, and I hope three. So this should be sufficient. Maybe there were more brackets in the official formulation, but this this one is okay, right? Okay. Uh, so um, the problem was that uh, if this formula is true, then the um, model, the structure where it is uh, satisfied, is infinite. So if we denote this by I don't know a of okay, let's call it a. So if in an um, and, and, and if in a structure this formula is true, uh, then uh, let me write it just it's, uh, this one. Yep. Uh, then uh, m is infinite. So. Uh, this shows the power of uh, binary predicates as opposed to unary ones. So as you remember, for unary ones, uh, we could always, uh, if something was satisfiable, we could always satisfy it in a finite model, just because there were finitely many possibilities to um, give a value to these predicates. So here it is impossible. And OK, uh, if someone wants to show how it is solved, then please tell me and proceed. If not, I will show the solution myself. OK, if nobody wants to show a solution, I will show my own. Um, so uh, first, let us start with the formula and let's try to read it. So the formula discusses this Q. So Q is a binary predicate. So its interpretation, well, we can call it like this, is a binary relation on this set M, right? And let's uh, ask ourselves what properties of this, bin of this binary relation we see in formula A. It's kind of looked like transitivity, uh, the yes. third one. The but, third uh, one is the... First... What? The, the inverse. So we can hear or we can see that uh, Q, X and Y, uh, and then it implies that uh, Q Y, uh, y and Z uh, implies uh, Q, X and Z. It's, it's kind of inversed. No, no, it's normal transitivity. Because you see that, let me just put it somewhere here. So this form, this way of writing down things is just equivalent uh, to this way of writing down things, right? Yeah, yeah. So this means that if Q of X, Y and Q of Y, Z, then Q of X, C. So how can you draw it? You see that you have an arrow from X to Y and you have an arrow from Y to Z. And then you will have an arrow from X to Z. This is indeed transitivity, right? Not a sort of inverse. It's just real transitivity, normal transitivity. And it's not uh, reflexivity. Yeah, it's well, uh, 
it's more than not reflexivity, it's irreflexivity. Irreflexivity. So not reflexivity means that for some x it could be not xx. But here you say that this is for anyone. Yeah. So no, there's no, no reflexive points. No, uh, there is no x which is in the relation with itself. So this is called irreflexivity. So it's transitive, it's irreflexive. And uh, this guy says uh, the following. It says that uh, it's so-called serial. Which means that uh, for any x there exists another element which is in the relation. And now how do we show that this is indeed infinite? So we take, better to depict it, so we will use seriality. We take some x0. Indeed, uh, well this is the general property of first order interpretations that uh, there exists at least one element. Empty interpretation is not allowed. It's just a matter of def definition. That's why, for example, uh, for all x, p of i of x entails ex exists x a of x. So in our model, it's not empty. We have at least one element. So what will seriality give us from this x? The first condition. What 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 would it uh, entail? There exists uh, y. Yeah, there exists another element which I will denote by x1, which is in the relation q. Uh, could this element be the same as x0? Uh, no. Because it's uh, irreflexive, right? Irreflexive. What can we do next? Uh, well, we can we apply serialit. Yeah, we can apply uh, x2, for example, and we can uh, apply transitivity. Yeah, so if we have x1 and x2, if we apply transitivity, we know that it's also in this relation, right? Yeah. Why is it important? These are all Qs. Uh, because this x2 could not coincide with x1, because otherwise we violate irreflexivity, but it could also not satisfy, not be the same as x0, because x0 is also in the relation with x2. And if x2 is the same as x0, then we again get reflexive point. So this means that we have that x1 is not equal to x0, x2 is not equal to x1, x2 is not equal to x0, and you see that we can continue. We can find x3, and this x3, it will be in this relation with all the previous ones, again to, due to transitivity. So here we'll see that this x3 is not equal to x0, x3 is not equal to x1, and x3 is not equal to x2. So this means that these are, we have one, two, three, four, five. So we, are, we can continue this procedure, of course, uh, at infinitum. So this, this goes more and more and more points. And this means that uh, this set M, which is the support of our, it includes at least these points. So it includes x1, x0, x2, etc. And this is infinite because uh, we have just shown that all these x's, they are different, they are different points. Otherwise, we fail to, we, we show by transitivity that, so we can say the following, that uh, Q of x i x j if j is greater than i, right? This is by transitivity. And therefore, uh, x i could not coincide with x j because we have irreflexivity. So this means that these, this app infinite set is a subset of uh, um, m. Well, this means that m is infinite. m could include other elements, of course, but uh, the, these are, uh, this should be there, which means that we have uh, inf infinite uh, support, infinite set of our elements, right? Okay, great. So, uh, if this is clear, let's go to something else. And uh, let's try uh, 1E. 
which is just interesting. It's funny it's in its formulation. Exists x, uh, d of x, then for all y, d of y. Uh, first, of course, the standard question, does anyone want to show the solution? The problem is whether it is generally true. It's always true. It should be D, I think, not P. Okay, and what next? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right, what next? Okay, <laughs> uh, once again, uh, we have uh, two ways to satisfy the formula. The one is uh, if uh, the D is uh, true for all uh, Y's, for all Y, for every Y, and the second, if uh, there exists some um, x uh, and on which uh, the d is not true, so it's general too. Because uh, of course, on every element, uh, the relation is uh, either true or not true. Yeah, exactly. So actually, the second line could be also rewritten in the following form: exists x not d of x or for all y, d of y, right? Because th this part does not depend on x and you can uh, move it away from the existential quantifier. And this is trivially uh, true, right? That either you uh, satisfy d for all elements or you have an element which falsifies it. So this equivalent, th these all formulae which written here are equivalent and therefore you get uh, the understanding. So, uh, it looks clear. Uh, before going further, I would like to uh, highlight an informal meaning of, of the formula, which is here. It's a funny thing. It's called the drinker's formula. Drinker's formula. Uh, it says that in a bar, if the bar is not empty, there always exists a person that if that person drinks, that everyone else also drinks. So if there exists an X such that if X drinks, D means that the person drinks, therefore you use this D instead of P or something like that. Then for all Y, D of Y. So you see that this is classically true, uh, but on the other uh, side, well, in this formulation, it's a bit counterintuitive because uh, when people th talk about implication, uh, they say that uh, implication should cause causation in a sense in natural language. So if I say, okay, if I drink, everyone drinks. This means that I sort of motivate the people to drink by drinking myself. Here, nothing uh, nothing happens. So um, the real story is as follows. Indeed, we consider two cases. And if everyone drinks, then they do not need to be caused to drink. They just drink. But if there exists a person who does not drink, that uh, then, then we'll get our uh, implication x files so, from false that if we uh, if, if that person drank then indeed everyone would drink but he is sober and therefore uh, this this implication is true because it's left hand side is uh, falsified okay so um do you have any other requests for solving something from that list Okay, suppose that no other 
Okay, I suppose that no other requests are here, so we can proceed to the next uh, problem sheet, and I will show it right now. Uh -huh. It's already on the web, so yeah, here you see it on the screen, and I will copy the link to the chat. So, um, yes, it's here. It's called Turing and Graphs, and uh, uh, Unfortunately, we're a bit, uh, so our seminars are a bit before the lectures. Uh, we're supposed to discuss Turing machines today at the lecture, but the lecture was also about P and NP, which is important and which sort of motivates us for studying Turing machines. Therefore, Evgeny didn't uh, have time to discuss Turing machines. And uh, so let me give a sh short introduction now. And uh, the next lecture will repeat this, of course, because uh, we'll need them. So why do we need Turing machines uh, in general? Because uh, we need a general uh, model of computation. So uh, the next step of our lecture course will be proving Kuklevin theorem. And Kuklevin says that if we have a problem, which say problem A, which belongs to NP, then we uh, can reduce it by uh, m polynomial m reduction to say satisfiability so you see that satisfiability is a concrete problem uh, this uh, is uh, the question of whether a given boolean formula is satisfiable but a is something general so it's some problem which can be solved by an algorithm which is np well there are two definitions say you have a non-deterministic algorithm and for arbitrary, so there is a quantifier that for any algorithm, something should hold. That any algorithm, any, al any algorithm generates a problem which it satisfies, and such a problem should have a given property. Well, exactly this one. So uh, this is something which we didn't come across before. So usually the quantifier for algorithms, so this here, this says for any A. This for any. Usually we had as a quantifier exists an algorithm. So the standard, say, theory of computing, theory of computer science, usually uh, does the following. They um, take um, a problem and try to solve it. And the result is a solution. The solution is an algorithm can be implemented on a computer. Here we take the algorithm as an input and try to prove something about it. This means that we should need to uh, take the notion of the algorithm really seriously and formalize it. What is to be an algorithm? And so the notion of algorithm is dependent from the notion of model of computation. A model of computation is a formal model of what a good computer is. So a computer which can solve arbitrary things in uh, in a given class, say in P or all uh, computable functions, something like that. Why model? Well, because uh, uh, analyzing code which is applicable to real computers is really a nightmare because the specification of a really working computer is a sort of very big book with many technicalities. So we need here, we need to have a simplified model of computation, simple theoretical which is easy for analyzing. There are several such models. Uh, they based on different ideas. So there are, see, there's a lambda calculus, there is the theory of recursive functions on natural numbers, et cetera, et cetera. But here we uh, stay on the more traditional one, which is called Turing machines. So a Turing machine is a formal mo model of computation which is really easy to define and easy to analyze. But uh, nevertheless, it's complete in the sense that anything which you can compute on a real computer can be computed on a Turing machine. And we'll see that polynomiality will also survive. So this is it means that A is and P will do a Turing machine, which solves it, and then we'll proceed. So today we'll just have a bit of training in what you can do with Turing machines and how you, how you can, in a sense, program on them. Okay, let me show the definitions. So the Turing machine, uh, the, uh, it was named after Alan Turing, who invented this formal notion. 
well, it's formally speaking, you have this M, which includes um, a sigma gamma. Um, let me see the next one is, um, um, let us call P or delta. This is the set of uh, rules. Ah, no, 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 first you have Q. Sorry, you have here, you have Q, which is the set of states rules and here you have q0 and q final what does all this mean in a turing machine uh you have this infinite uh what they call it uh tape which is split into cells and each cell holds a letter and in the end, it's the last letter, and then you will have these big Bs, which fall, say, for blank. And here also have blanks. So on the tape, you have a what they call the zone, the memory which is really used, and it's where you have your meaningful elements. And on the right and on the left, you have uh, just uh, blanks, which says that these uh, elements of the tape were not yet used. So this uh, A, B, C, and all these letters, uh, they are elements of the set gamma, which is the internal alphabet. These are letters you can use in your computation. And this is a subset of, no, it's a, sorry, it's a superset of the set sigma. So uh, sigma is the alphabet in which we formulate our input and output. And gamma is the internal alphabet. So using in, inside the computation procedure, you are allowed to use um, you are allowed to use uh, the uh, letters which are not in the final alphabet. So these are sort of redundant letters which are used for te technical things. And there is this uh, controlling unit which sees one of the uh, elements of the tape. So uh, memory here is not what they call random access. At each time you see only one uh, cell of your tape and you can read and write only to one piece of memory. If you wish to use another one you have to shift to others. And inside this you will have an internal memory which is uh, realized as the state which is in Q. So we start in state Q0, then we execute our machine. How it works? We have P, which is set of rules. So a rule is of the form PA to QBD. So uh, D is one of RLN. So R means move right, L means move left, and R, R N means stay at the same point. So how this should work? It's this rule, to if, if we are in state P and we can move to, and we observe the symbol A, then we can change our state to Q, re replace our uh, symbol with B, and apply the So for example, suppose we have the following rule, Q, C to C R R F R. What should the machine do? How do you think? In the in this particular configuration, if it is like that, how do you think? Uh, write A in the um, say, um F in yes. the cell cell that is uh, um, outlined. Um, then uh, move to the right, uh, so the cell with A will be uh, selected and the state will be uh, R after that. Yes, exactly. So it performs three operations. It changes the symbol, it maybe changes the cell which it observes, and also it changes the state. So, okay, uh, of course, uh, we could uh, refuse to change the state. We can say the same Q. We can, instead of F, we could have been C here. And we also can, we're allowed not to move. 
Uh, but if nothing happens, then the machine will get stuck. So it's possible to write a rule which just changes nothing. So PA into PAN. But this means that the machine would just say, OK, I'm, I will just uh, stay in this configuration forever because I like it and nothing will go on. So uh, the machine, uh, Turing machine could be deterministic or non-deterministic. So it's like today's lecture, we have seen that there are deterministic algorithms and non-deterministic algorithms. So in the Turing machine, if you have this uh, PA, if you have, for example, this, but also you have something like this, If you have both and they're different, then this is not determinism. If nothing like that happens, you are deterministic, you are fine. Okay. So, uh, so far so good. Uh, deterministic Turing machines, they are capable of uh, modeling standard, say, uh, computations. Uh, so the machine always knows what to do. And as usual in computer programming, the machine can get stuck. It can uh, never st stop. But if it stops, then on the tape, well, when it stops, it stops. When, so in, in the, it starts with Q0 and observes the input data here. And usually the pointer is to the beginning of this input data. And it stops at QF. Once it reaches QF, it says, OK, I'm fine. I will not go further. And you can read the answer from the tape. So in our case, we uh, consider, um, mostly we consider uh, decision problems, which means that the results are zero or one. So it should just point to a, so in the state QF, uh, the machine should point to a cell where you observe say one or zero. If it does something else, we can say that it failed. It's a bad answer. If it's not zero and not one, we don't know what it does. Or we can say that it's a false unless it's uh, declared explicitly to be true. Okay, so this is just the model of computing things. So is that clear? Is the def definition of Turing machine clear? Yes. Yeah, great. So we move to the next slide and we uh, see the problems here. So let us uh, try 1A and 1B will of course be for your exercise. So what is 1A? We have uh, the following starting configuration. So we uh, have the tape. We, um, so here we have our, so this is blank and these are blanks. We have units which, uh, uh, so these are X times, right? And then we start with blanks. And let me remove this part because I want to write down there. Mm -hmm. And we, uh, of course, have this uh, operating unit, which is, so here we have state Q0, which is the starting one. And it observes the first symbol here. And the function it should compute, it uh, should map X onto X plus one. So the question is how to implement that as a Turing machine. What should it do? So uh, the first uh, letter in the formula is the uh, symbol that goes into Q0, as I remember collect correctly. And the second mm -hmm. one is uh, which goes on the tape, right? Yes, yes. So it should be uh, yeah, Q Q0 plus 1, uh, Q0 plus 1, and R. R. All right. Okay. So it shifted to the, this one, yeah. No, you cannot write another rule. It should be deterministic. So here you should write another, another letter. Yeah, it's, it's a blank.
No, if you write Q0 here, then you will actually um, Okay, so you are now in a state, in some other state, which you denote by, I don't know, Q1. And you are here. Yeah, this is some other solution here. Uh, no, it's a, a, bit, a bit, a bit more. Yep, so, uh, no, this, this will make it uh, hold. No, not hold, but get stuck in Q1. So what happened after that was done? So now you have the following. You have the same tape. So let me put another B here. And now you have the following. So now you have this B, one, one, etc. One. And now you will have one here, still B here, and here you will have your pointer, which says Q1, right? And actually, you uh, basically you are done, but you need to return your uh, pointer backwards. So instead of that, I would suggest the following. I would suggest uh, that if you are in state Q1 and you observe 1, uh, then uh, we should move backwards. So we have uh, Q1 1 uh, moves to... Uh, oh no 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 sorry sorry this is not correct uh, q1 uh, sees not this one uh, it, it sees this one right you, yeah you're right so it sees this the same so now you should see that you move to the left again you can keep your state q1 uh, you write again one and you go left so now your machine is going to move uh, this direction until your Q1 happens here. And it observes this B. And now you uh, just return and you say that if you have Q1 and it observes B, uh, then you uh, finally go to the final state QF. You keep this B there and you say right. And now you're, you go backwards and here you will have qf and qf observes this one and this is the answer which is x plus one right we should go through our tape two times yes we will go through our tape two times right here here actually there is another solution which i will write down here which makes use of the fact that our tape is really two-sided, that you can go both left and right. You can say like this, you take Q0, you observe one, and uh, you just go Q1, keep this one and go left, and then you take Q1, which observes now a blank, and it goes to Q final, Rise down one and does nothing. This is a simpler machine which will do the job because here you just say, okay, I'll go here and I will change my state first to Q1, but then to QF with rewriting this guy with one. And this adds just this unit on the left, not on the right. This is also possible because our definition of Turing machine allows us to. Uh, um to uh, go both left and right there is an equivalent definition we're not going to prove equivalence but uh, it's just for you to understand that you can disallow going to the left you can uh, say that their uh, tape is allowed to grow only to the right and then this solution will fail okay may i ask you a question yes uh, so this one is what I'm highlighting now. Uh, it's the full algorithm, am I right? So yes, yes, yes. It should be the full algorithm. So Q0, it's like right here. If we, uh, in, in our input, we have Q0 and 1. So we go left and change Q0 to Q1 and blank 
uh, oh no. So this should be one, and we go left. And we here we one? see blank, and when the we change our Q1 to QF. So the this algorithm uh, and the blank the gets changed to one. Um, but our algorithm will stop after two steps. Yes, we stop, stop after two steps and it will add an extra one to the line. It will not go to the right at, at all. Hello, do you hear me? Understand it? Yeah, I can hear you, but I quite don't understand you. No, no, the, 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 so you have you have many, many ones, many units, right? X times. What do you need is to add an extra unit, right? In the previous solution, you added this on the right. And in order to do this, you had to traverse through all these uh, units and uh, find out the place. So th this is the place where we should uh, put the extra unit. And we had to go, go, go to this place. Then we replaced it with the unit and then we went backwards, right? But the green solution uh, says that we should we're not obliged to do this because there is another blank which is here. We are seeing the unit. We just make one step to the right where in state Q1 here, we observe B, we replace this B by the unit, which is the unit. And uh, we uh, move safely to QF. And after that, you will have one more unit, which is X plus one. Indeed. OK, maybe I didn't quite understand uh, the the question because uh, calculates X plus one. I thought that we should uh, output uh, a sum. Of this no, X plus one, it's it's we, X we plus one. Just, OK, uh, so we should just add uh, we should just switch a blank to one. Uh, yes, am I right? No, no. What, does, what does it mean to calculate X plus one in unary notation? So this is X, right? Yes. This is one. This is X plus one. OK, so we just uh, should switch uh, the first uh, uh, mat blank to one. And that's all. Yes, yes, okay. yes, yes. Well, uh, the, this uh, blank should be adjacent to this block of ones. It should be yeah. nearby. That should to left or right. No, but that's this is all, of course. That's how yeah. tape works, right? Uh, there yes. should not be blank here, for example. Yes, yes. Yeah. Okay. Because uh, the input is given without blanks. Okay. Blanks and are not elements of sigma. Our Q zero is always on uh, on the first. Uh, X on the first uh, cell. Yes, right. it's, it's yeah. the, the first symbol of X. It should be on the first symbol of X. OK, so we sh we start always at the beginning. OK. Yes, and we should and we should end at the beginning. Hmm. OK, so uh, here there is, by the way, one condition that X should be strictly greater than zero. Because if X is zero, everything fails because there is no one here. It starts with a blank. You can think at home how to add commands for the zero case. And also, of course, the interesting part is this one, the binary notation. Here you should really implement some computations. OK, so uh, does this make sense? Any questions, uh, remarks, comments? Yeah, here one. So here we should add uh, either zero or one to the blank. Where here? Uh, no, in the B. Uh, in the B. In section. B. No, no. In binary notation, there will be zeros and ones. Yeah. And there will be a number which is presented just as a normal binary form. Okay. So for example, if we want to, if, if uh, in the, in one B, if we want to represent, say, uh, uh, x equals I don't know, twelve. So what how what is twelve in binary in binary notation? It is eight plus four, right? 
So it is one, one, zero, zero in binary notation. So this means that in our input tape, uh, we're going to have one, one, zero, zero. This is going to be Q zero here. So this is one B. And uh, these are going to be blanks, here blanks and here blanks. So okay. this is our input. And we need to add units. So here the situation is easy because what we can do, we can, the answer will be uh, just one, one, zero, one, right? Yes. So we'll find this last zero here, we replace it with one. But if we say x equals 13, then we'll get one, one, zero, one. And now to, in order to add the unit, we need to go one, one, one zero so if the last digit is one then we should flip it to zero but we need to add the unit to the previous cell and so this could be if it is say one one zero one 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 then we should add the unit you will get zero 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 here will be one and here will you this is this is not uh, changed so you should really implement this algorithm of adding the unit in binary notation. It is the same as you were taught at school for decimal notation. It's even easier. Does this make sense? Yes. What is if the number is 15? OK, so the, the question is uh, 15. So 15 is. Uh, uh yes it's an interesting one it's uh eight plus one 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 yeah right so it's 16 minus one and we did need to add a new digit so here we if we do it we'll have this one so we'll have one 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 and one here is blank so we start from here we have to somehow go here 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 replacing all these guys with zeros and add an extra digit on top, of course. This could happen. And actually, in the unit notation, this always happened. We always added an extra digit. But here we do it only for uh, for uh, binary notations of this form, which correspond to numbers 2 to the n minus 1. Here you will have to increase the number of digits. Right, yes. Uh, thank you, Anwar. It is a really good question. OK. So far, so good. Let's move to uh, point two. So we'll have to do to A. It's an easier one, and uh, uh, because this will be necessary for us to, for you to do three, which will be for your home task. Uh, this is a three is really an exercise, and uh, it's just for your home thinking. And let's do two. So two says that um, we need to show that something is in P, and uh, this language is well. Um, and let's uh, re idea that uh, we, what language we are going to discuss. So we discuss the language which is called zero and oh sorry uh, one n, where n is well. I, let me see. It's greater, or greater, or equal. Is, yes, it's, it's called K here. Let's put it K. And where K is a greater or equal than 1. So it's non-zero. Because with zero, it's also possible, but the empty word it could be problematic. So this word is defined like you have a K zeros and you have K ones. And the question is, uh, so uh, if x is of this form, then return yes, which means 1, and else we should return 0. So, okay, does anyone have an idea how to solve this using a Turing machine? So, in the Turing machine, you will have this infinite tape. So, there are blanks padding here, and then you will have some input. So this input is zeros and ones.
but we don't know whether it is in, the, in this form or is something else. I'm sorry, uh, I have a question. Okay. Uh, is it possible to have two tapes? <laughs> it's a very nice question. Uh, very, very good question. Really a marvelous question. Uh, in our definition of Turing machine, no. Uh, but uh, there is a theorem that you can, uh, if you have a two tape machine, for example, you can simulate it on a one tape machine. But what I wanted to say to you that your gamma, your internal alphabet, it's more than zero, one, and this blank symbol. So you can use new symbols if you wish to encode something. Does this help? Does that mean that I can use another symbol to uh, specify that I have uh, like a K number of zeros? So when but I what, check, what does uh, it mean K? You, you know, you, you can have a finite number of them. You cannot keep, so your internal mm. memory is here, right? So you have a state Q, which starts with Q0. You cannot keep the number K inside this one because you have only a finite number of states and a finite number of letters. So this means that you cannot keep a natural number in your memory. It should be written somehow on the tape. Understood. Okay. So how do you uh, start? Okay, what does what do we observe? Yeah, we, we have a Q0. It's kind of from memory. No, it's memory, finite memory. Yeah, okay, it's one cell, but but still. Yeah, it's not it's not a cell, it's the internal state. We can keep something in the memory, and here you have an element of this set Q. The Q is a set of states. Okay, let's let me start. So let me. Uh, a question, please. Uh, if you say that uh, gamma uh, includes more alphabets, so uh, more uh, characters, let's... or uh, uh, yeah, uh, does that mean that uh, I can uh, uh, like uh, define a sequence of those alphabets? So it's no, like no, the same it, should, like... it should be fixed. It, sh it should be fixed. It could not depend on your input. Mm, okay. Okay. Uh, we can weave the input through the middle, replacing zeros and ones with an eternal symbol, and if something goes wrong. Say we reject the input. Yeah, this is the correct idea, and maybe we could formally try to realize it. So the problem is that uh, the word could be even not of the form, uh, say, uh, of this form. For arbitrary numbers of them, so there could be, there could be interleaving numbers and stuff like that. So okay, what happens if we starting with Q zero observe symbol one? What happens then? Do we reject the input? No, we not skip it, we reject the input, right? So uh, this means that we should say QF, we say zero, and we do nothing. And now here is zero, and this is this says that it is the return of false. Okay, so if we have Q0 and we observe zero, then we are probably right. So we have a zero here. And what we have to do is to check that uh, there is a one in here. And if it is true, then we will, uh, we, will we, are, we are good. So, uh, by the way, we are allowed to destroy the input data. We are not uh, obliged to keep it, even if our answer is yes. So the idea I want to uh, present here is as follows that you uh, will go gradually to the center by just removing these guys. So instead of this, we suggest that here we should put a blank. We should find this guy and also remove it and put a blank here. And then return to this position and start with Q0 again. So we'll go this way and then backwards. 
And then we, if we converge to the center and uh, we find out that uh, it's uh, the same, then we are fine, right? So how can we implement this strategy? We can say that this is Q0, which moves to Q, some Q1, replaces this with blank and moves right. Okay, and that, next we should uh, think about Q1. So now we are here in, in, in state Q1. So what happens next? Uh, next we should uh, go to the right and find the blank. So if we are in Q1, and we observe the zero, we move to the right, just keeping this zero, and the same for one. So now we're in state Q1 and we're here. Okay. Then we we'll move again to the left. So we go, if you will see the blank, it means that we reach the end of the input zone and we are in state Q2. Oh, sorry. We keep the blank. We don't want to move it and we do left. So now we are here, here in state Q2. Okay, so what should we do next? Next, we should say that uh, if we are in state Q2, let me continue here. So if we are in state Q2 and we see, say, blank, what does that mean? It means that actually a blank was, uh, so this means that actually we started from here, we observed a blank, already here, moved backwards here, right, to this point. So this means that we should fail. And the same if we observe a zero. Right? Does this make sense? Is it understandable? So what happened? We moved to the we moved up to this blank symbol here. We moved backwards, and we see that this is not one. This is a zero. This means that this should should fail. This should be not. A, uh, this, it should be one. So the correct situation is when we are in state Q two, and we observe the one. Okay. Uh, do we really have to um, do this thing with Q2 and B? Because uh, uh, we can uh, um, go to Q2 only from Q1, B, and... Uh... No, no, the problem is, suppose that originally we had only one letter. So suppose we had only this situation that we had... I was write a small tape down here. So we were, we were in state Q0, and this was 0, and this was the only symbol on the tape. This is a possible situation, right? The word is non empty, it is the input word, right? Then in this case, we what, what should we do? We uh, replaced this guy with uh, a blank. our state became Q1 and we shifted here, right? And then when we changed to Q2, we, we moved backwards. So, so we are now here in state Q2 and we observe this blank. So for this situation, we had to include this role. Is, is it understandable? Uh, okay, thank you. Uh -huh. Yes. Okay, so now we are in state Q2, we observe the unit. And what should we do? Oh, sorry. Uh, what should we do now? So, uh, what should we do next? How do you think? 
move to spot mm. three. You three and the blank and go to the left. Q3 blank to the left. So now we're here in state Q3. And now what? Now we should again move here to the last say symbol, which is not blank. So now we're from Q3. If we are in Q3 and we observe zero, we should keep it and go. If we are in Q3 and we observe one, we should keep it and go. And interesting cases when we're in Q3 and we observe blank. What cap happens now? Uh, go to Q0, keep blank and go to the right. Yeah, so we go to Q0, keep blank and go to the right. And now, uh, OK, well, we start once more, right? Again, we, we go forward. And how can, so is this the, it looks like the complete algorithm, right? Mm, uh, the only thing is that if we are in Q0 and blank, that we should uh, go to Q final uh, one and uh, stay. Yeah, Q0 blank. Uh, should go to Q final one and now. This is the success, the, the end of success. And actually here we did not the task we were supposed to do, but here we did it with zero here. Because this guy also accepts the empty word. Right? If in the, in the beginning uh, the word was empty, then we just uh, return one just in, in the beginning using this uh, this rule. Okay, so uh, of course we can modify it in order to make this zero. The modification is simple. We just add a new starting state Q0 tiled, and we just say that Q0 with the blank it's it just goes to fail so fail is uh, this was one is fail and everything else just changes it to q so if you have q0 and you have 0 or 1 then you just change it to q0 and nothing else changes right so this is the solution for task number 2a So um, let me see. We have 15 minutes left. And uh, the um, uh, option which I would like you to, to, which I would like us to follow is that three and four are going to be as home thinking. And let's a bit discuss of graphs. So, uh, And yes, it's again a bit of uh, uh, bad synchronization in lectures and seminars. Uh, we didn't discuss graphs yet, but uh, now it's a good point to discuss them. Uh, so let me uh, introduce some basic notions and uh, they will be as follows. So what is a graph? Uh, so graph is a pair of V and E where V is a set of vertices and E is a set of edges. In the usual understanding of an unoriented uh, graph without uh, uh, parallel edges and without uh, loops, E is just a subset of uh, V times V. So we have the vertices and some pairs of the vertices are connected like this. They could intersect also. They could be isolated vertices. They could be unconnected ones. So such uh, such things are called graphs. Graphs play an important role in uh, uh, data analysis. 
because uh, a graph is a representation of a relational structure somehow. So we, what we will have uh, in the uh, home assignment number two, we're going to discuss the graph of friendship on uh, social networks. So uh, friendship is a symmetric relation. No one is the friend of, of, its, of himself. And so uh, this is can be depicted like this. And also all maps, they include graph theoretical things and uh, all these uh, relational databases, etc. So you can see it's just a binary relation on a finite set. And now we need the following notions. So here we have the notion of degree. It's just the number of vertices or edges which is connected. So for example, which is what is the degree of this vertex? I will write it in red. What degree does it have? Three. Three. Well, this is three. Say so this is four. This is zero. So these are degrees denoted by deg of the vertex V. And also there are paths. Uh, so uh, a path is just a, a series of vertices. Uh, which goes along the graph. So here and here, here they could be other vertices, edges, but this is a path. And the path is called simple if it never comes back to the same vertex. So a path could be non-simple. For example, here I go here, then I go here, then I go here, then I return, go here, here, again here, and then I go here. This is a path, but it's not simple. So we're interested in uh, Hamiltonian and Euler paths. So uh, the Euler path comes from the famous uh, Königsberg bridge problem, which I will discuss at one of the lectures. And the Hamiltonian cycle is a, also a cyclic path, which visits each vertex exactly once. The Euler path which visits each edge exactly once. OK, so let us uh, try to solve 5a. Mm, OK. Let's see 5a. Nine vertices. Let me write it down just to copy that. So 9, 3, uh, 11, 4, 10, 5. So, so I think it's 5a, right? So there should be nine vertices of degree 3. 11 of degree 4 and 10 of degree 5. How do you think? Could such a graph exist? Well, what is the uh, uh, hint which is uh, written down here? If the graph exists, how many edges should this graph have? Um, should be 100 and uh, no, 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 it's 60 and half. 60 and a half. So how could you calculate it? You have to take 9 multiplied by 3 plus 11 multiplied by 4 plus uh, 10 multiplied by 5. And this should be divided by 2, right? Because each edge uh, uh, has two uh, ends. It starts somewhere and somewhere. So each edge was counted twice if we just did the sum of the degrees. But this is, uh, what is 60.5, right? Yes. And it is not an integer. And the number of edges is always an integer, right? Because it's the, each edge is just an object. So this means that such a graph does not exist. Is this clear? So in general, you could write it as the following formula. So the sum for each V inside the number of vertices, the degree of V is 2 multiplied by the number of edges, right? It's just the same, but in, uh, in the general case. Not for a concrete graph, but for a uh, for uh, an arbitrary one. And you see that this guy on the right, it should be always even. 
because it's just uh, literally dividable by two. And this is called what they call the handshake lemma. And which says the following, that if we have people in a group or in all, and we count the uh, number of people who made an odd number of handshakes, then this number should be even. Because if we sum up the whole number of handshakes, which are edges in the graph, then we will get an even number. So this shows that this stuff is uh, non-existent. For B and C, please try to do it at home and uh, beware that this is not a criterion. So even if the number of uh, edges, or, or then some of the degrees is even, this does not guarantee that such a graph exists. So um, examples uh, could be uh, produced using this tool. Okay, so now, now let's, ne ne let us, yep. Yeah? Could it be parallel edges? No, parallel edges are not allowed. Okay. No parallel edges, no loops. But by the way, this formula keeps valid even if we have parallel edges. And it, it's valid if we have loops. Uh, again, uh, if we count each loop as adding two to the degree. So if we have a loop, then uh, there are two edges say, coming backwards. But this is the same edge. But we don't have parallel edges in loops. Okay, so 5b and 5c are going home. Now uh, let's say 6a. So we have three vertices of degree 3 and one vertex of degree 5. Can this graph have an Euler path? That Euler path traverses each edge exactly once. So there are three of degree three and one of degree five. So this is degree. Mm -hmm. So that there in such a graph, could there exist an Euler path? I don't know about Euler path, but if we don't have a loops and uh, parallel edges, this graph could not exist at all. Yes, exactly. This is the actual solution. So let's say why. This graph could not exist because the total number of, uh, this is four, and this is something of degree five. With parallel edges, this graph exists, and it is the famous Euler graph of Königsberg. Okay, so uh, for, pop, let's do like this, that for point six, I don't remember what happens for point B at the moment, but if it becomes trivial, if you disallow parallel edges, then allow parallel edges, okay? And I think point seven, we have this Hamiltonian cycle, so we have to visit each vertex exactly once. Again, uh, take a look at this graph and uh, see well, how it is going to traverse it. Uh, this graph, by the way, is the graph of the dodecahedron, which is, a. Uh, let me even show it here. So this is, uh, let's see the Wikipedia. The dodecahedron is, uh, looks like that. It's a uh, three-dimensional solid, which is, uh, they got it flat just on the plane. And it became this nice graph. And the question is whether you can traverse all these vertices, visiting each of them at exactly once, and re returning to the original vertex. This is a cycle in the graph. Okay, so any questions at this point? Questions, comments, objections? Mm, I, I have a formula, but I don't know, is it fair? Yeah, this graph does have a Hamiltonian cycle. Okay. Yes, so, but this is uh, left for home assignment for other people also to think about it. If you know a formula, uh, which uh, sometimes can say that Hamiltonian cycle exists, you are, then you are uh, fine. But uh, if you don't know such a formula, it's also okay, because you can just uh, constructively show this example of this Hamiltonian cycle. We'll leave it for the next class. Okay, any other questions, comments? 
Okay, if no, then I will uh, fi finish this uh, class with the following, say, a general notice that uh, Hamiltonian and Euler cycles are ex intrinsically different. An Euler cycle, it traverses uh, edges, and finding an Euler cycle is easy. It's polynomially time decidable to, and to find out whether an Euler cycle exists, and also to uh, find such a cycle if you need. For Hamiltonian cycles, the uh, problem is NP-complete, so unless P equals NP, we don't know, we cannot solve it in polynomial time. So a Hamiltonian cycle problem may seem a, a bit uh, artificial, but uh, it, it is useful, among some other problems, for the following. There is this uh, problem which is called uh, subgraph isomorphism. And uh, subgraph isomorphism is a problem of uh, finding an isomorphic copy of a given subgraph in a given graph. And it's also an NP-hard problem in general, NP-complete. And this problem uh, is already related to what we really need in um, data analysis, because what it actually represents, it represents the idea that um, you're inside a very big graph which represents a network or something like that, you search for some pattern. It's like uh, searching in Google or Yandex for words or for some phrases inside the internet, but now we're searching not for just linear strings of symbols, but for some graph theoretic structures. This is quite important in, uh, uh, in information search. Okay, so this is the final notice and let's uh, stop here, yep, so. Um, Yes, let us stop here and then I will answer the uh, question by Anwar. Uh, yes, the answer is no to your question that if we say that a task is left for home, then this means that this is just for your personal training and for our discussion at the next time. Uh, graded homeworks, they are explicitly designated as such. And uh, we will have three of them. The first one, by the way, is already posted. Let me maybe even uh, show that. Uh, so uh, please uh, see the uh, problem. Uh, see it here. So it's home assignment number one. It's the formulation of the task here, uh, which is here. Uh, and this is the way how you can submit it via GitHub Classroom. If you have problems with that, or if you write not in Python 3, but in another language, then you can just submit it by email to me. Uh, so uh, there is a deadline of October 5, it's strict. And the, basically the problem is uh, for applying resolutions to, to CNS. The second home assignment or the midterm, uh, it will be handed out next week. And uh, I think exactly after the class uh, for smaller time, which is which they will have to solve some problems in just uh, and submitted by email, the theoretical problems. The third home assignment will be again programming. It will consider social network analysis. So uh, these are the three uh, official assignments which uh, will be graded and uh, used. And all other things which I say that are left for home thinking, they are just for yourselves. We do not grade them. We do not check whether you actually solve it, but uh, please uh, do this because it will help you understand the uh, subject better. Thank you for the question. It's really important. And I think this is the final end of the class. Thank you for attention.